What's up everybody, it's Brian for GadgetUnit.com and in this video I will be ordering parts for a new PC, building it, testing it, and then raffling it off. More info on that towards the end of the video. You'll definitely want to stay tuned because you can potentially get this PC for as little as $1, so more info on that later. Now a couple months ago I built my personal PC. It was around $1,600 and it featured the Ryzen 7 3700X and an RTX 2070 Super. Pretty high end, I love it, and lately I've been thinking, how would a PC built using the cheapest parts on PC Part Picker perform in 2019. So I wanted to make a new build, the cheapest build possible, based on the Ryzen 3000G. So it's only a, a dual core four thread processor, but that does have the integrated Vega 3 GPU, which is kind of capable depending on what you're doing. And it's only 50 bucks. So that's what really had me interested in it. And based on the early reviews, it's definitely not the fastest processor, obviously, but it's definitely capable for the absolute basics. So I'm kind of interested to see how it can do those things. So let's go ahead and build our list. So again, this is going to be based on the Ryzen 3000G. It's not available yet, but as soon as it is, I will order it. Now I have been thinking about this whole build for the past couple of weeks, and I was originally going to just simply sort the price by the cheapest, pick whatever comes first, and go from there. However, with Black Friday and Cyber Monday deals going on right now, I'm kind of going to make a couple of exceptions. So the motherboard I've been, again, looking at over the past couple of weeks, and previously the A320 chipset was the cheapest. Fortunately, we have a B450 board, which allows us to overclock both the processor and the integrated GPU, whereas the A320 does not. So we will go ahead and add that. For the RAM, it's kind of been shifting over the past couple of weeks. Currently, we have three different 1799 options. I have been kind of looking at the speeds and the cast latency, the first option, DDR4-2400, CAS latency is 17. It's kind of in between the other 1799 options, so I'm probably going to go for that. Uh, AMD processors typically favor faster memory um, with tighter timings if you can get that combo. Um, I'm just going to pick the first one. Again, it seems to be in the middle. For the storage, I want to have this build be based on solid-state drives, at least 120 gigs in space. However, as you can see, we have an 1899 SSD that's 120 gigs. Before a dollar more, you can get double the storage. So even though I want it to be based off of the, just whatever comes up cheapest in the list, I think for an extra dollar to get you double the storage space is probably worth the extra buck. So I will choose that. For the case, the cheapest thing we have is a micro ATX case by Rosewill, the Ranger M. Let's go ahead and add that. The power supply I have been taking a look at over the past couple of weeks as well, and we have kind of had a couple of different options pop up. Currently the first one, the cheapest one, is kind of the better ones I've seen in terms of just cheapo power supplies. And this is it. So everything in this view is what we're going to have for this build. Pretty basic, not a lot of parts to it, so it's probably not going to take that long to put together. And this all comes in at 188 bucks. That is cheaper than an iPad, which I know it's a completely different type of product to compare to, but you can still install Windows 10 on here. And based on the early reviews of the 3000G, should be getting some pretty decent performance for productivity work, web browsing, and this would probably also be an okay HTPC CPU. Here it is, Friday the 6th. Everything has now arrived except for the processor, which I still haven't been able to purchase because it's not available in the U.S., despite being available in many other countries. Now, uh, just doing a quick overview of what we've got. It's a super cheap build, so there's really not a lot to it. Here we've got our 240 gig SSD. We've got our single DIMM. Um, hopefully the single channel config won't decrease performance too much, but I think for the applications that the 3000G is really meant for, it should be okay. We've got our cheapo power supply. Um, it doesn't have a dedicated four pin for the processor, but it does have an eight pin that splits into two four pins. So one of them fits on the motherboard, the other one does not. So hopefully that won't be a problem. We've got our motherboard, it's already Ryzen 3000 series ready, and it also supports the 200, 220, and 240GE, so the 3000G, which is pretty much the same thing as the last gen GE series, should be working out of the box without any type of BIOS update. Here is the motherboard, pretty basic micro ATX board. A lot of these boards have this 1X slot beneath the 16X slot, which means if you have a dual slot GPU, you can't really use this anymore, so I think this is a better config. Oh, before I forget, here is the case. I'm going to leave the plastic on it for now. It's still probably going to be another couple of weeks until I can get the processor, so I'm not going to take this off and damage the front. It is glossy black plastic, so it's probably going to scratch fairly easily. Nothing too crazy, but there is a front intake fan and a rear exhaust fan already included, which for 20-something bucks is really not that bad for 
what people will probably be putting into a cheap uh, a cheapy case like this. Anyway, while we are still waiting for the CPU, we could go ahead and put in what we can. We've only got two dim slots, so we will put the first one under slot A1, which is the one closest to the socket. So that goes in like so. And that's really all I can do to the motherboard for now. Uh, I didn't have to take off the brackets because the included heatsink for the 3000G just clips onto the side there. The side panel has been removed from the case. The two screws on the back of the side panel are not captive screws, so make sure that you don't lose those. Here we have all the front panel connectors. Fans seem to be okay. Not sure if that's an LED fan. Could be white. Might be nothing at all. Now let's go ahead and get the motherboard installed. Putting in the standoffs first. Here is number one, two, three, number four, five, and finally number six. Now I actually am wondering if this was a used case because you can kind of see some markings throughout the mounting area here. Some markings up there and kind of some other ones scattered about. May have just been a manufacturing thing. Again, this is a this was a $25 case, so I'm not expecting perfection, but um, still could have very well have been refurbished to some extent. Next up is the IO shield, and then we will finally get to the motherboard installation. These are definitely, or this rather, is definitely the sharpest IO shield I have used thus far, but still goes in just fine. This is also my first time trying to build a PC one-handed, so it's definitely an interesting challenge. Fortunately, this is a pretty simple build, so I'm not using super high-end parts, or else I would be a little bit careful. But this is, so far, working out okay. Now I'm screwing in the screws into the standoffs. There's the first one. Here's screw number two, three, four, five, and six. And now that the part that I hate the most when putting together any type of PC, plugging in the front panel connectors. Fortunately, the front panel audio is typically in the bottom left corner, so that one is easy. Uh, cable management might be a little bit of a problem here. Front USB is also fairly easy. Here, this case does not have USB 3 ports, it just has USB 2, so this one goes right here. Technically, there are a couple more USB 2 headers on the motherboard. These are usually a pain to plug in, so I had to refer to the motherboard like usual. I'm gonna do this off camera because it's kind of hard to plug those little things into the correct pins. Because the case came with a speaker, might as well plug it in. That goes into the headers right next to the front panel. For the SSD, I was trying to find the best place for it. It looks like I can technically mount it like this and then just put the two screws from inside of this uh, media card reader cage. But it, there are four screw holes at the bottom of the case that actually seem to be just four two and a half inch drives, so I will put it there. Bam, there is the SSD securely mounted to the bottom of the case. There are the four screws from the bottom. Now it's time to put in the power supply and plug everything else in. Just putting some more things into the other things. I also wanna point out that even though this is a budget case, the screws for the side panels actually have these little plastic covers on them to make unscrewing and screwing them in without using a screwdriver a lot easier. After some time trying to organize the cables, this is as good as I've been able to get it. It's not the prettiest of sights, but there aren't really a whole lot of places to hide the cables. Um, so that's just kind of the way it is. Two weeks later. It's been two and a half weeks and the 3000G is finally here on Christmas Eve nonetheless. Um, this is it. So it's a much smaller box than I was expecting, but I guess that's to be expected because the cooler that this comes with is actually noticeably smaller than what you get with even the 2200G. Um, I've been checking websites for several weeks on the 3000G. Finally found it on a site called shopblt.com. It costs a little bit more than retail. It was 53.13, I think. It's better than what B&H Photo is charging. They want 60 bucks for it. So this actually ends up being a bit cheaper. Funny enough, the packing slip actually says I ordered a Threadripper 3960X. Um, one of those I ordered, apparently. Uh, they didn't ship any of them, so that's unfortunate. Let's carefully open the box. Oh man, look at that tiny cooler. Apparently it is small yet effective, or else they would have included something bigger, so we'll see. Here is the 3000G itself in all of its $50 glory, depending on which site you buy from. Time for the final piece to this whole puzzle. We will drop in the 3000G right about there, close the retention arm, and figure out how to install the heatsink. I haven't dealt with this clip style thing before. That seems to be pretty much in place. Now it's time for the CPU fan. Uh, can't really wrap it around too much. Let's put it around the bunch of cables back there. 
that I think is good enough for what we will be getting from this. Let's go ahead and push the power button. There we go. So the rear fan is on, CPU fan is on, and the front intake fan is on. I guess everything seems to be working. I'm trying to check the power supply fan. Yep, that one is on as well. So all four fans appear to be functional. Turns out there's also a blue LED for the power button, so that's kind of nice. And let's go ahead and actually peel this off before getting into all of the software stuff. There is the front panel in all its glory. And here's an open shot without the side panel put on. Here I'm just prepping the flash drive with some files. We've got the new Adrenaline GPU drivers, the BIOS update, as well as the chipset drivers, plugging the flash drive into the back and now pushing the power button. Uh, it's a pretty bright intake fan on the front. Uh, the motherboard came with BIOS version 2.30, so I installed the latest version, which is 3.70. Afterwards, it's just a matter of booting from the flash drive, installing Windows, pretty basic process, and like I would expect nowadays, it's pretty quick as well. Now we are taking a listen to the fans. The power supply fan in particular is very loud and a bit obnoxious. Silence is what you're expecting from a $185 PC. This is not it. Here I'm just installing some of the drivers. The CPU temps are definitely well under control. Right now it's in the 50s doing all of this work. Now we are doing a basic Prime 95 blend test to see what the temperatures will hit. After not even a minute, it was slowly increasing still. And when I stopped it, it hit about 55 right there. Now I'm doing a basic Atto speed test for the SSD, plenty fast across the board. Next up, we are doing some 4K60 YouTube video playback. It occasionally skips frames if the UI for YouTube is coming up or going away or whatever, but otherwise it is pretty flawless. Uh, it's using quite a bit of the GPU. Now I'm transferring some games from my personal computer over to this Raffle PC over the network, maxing out the one gig connection there. Now we're just doing a speed test to see how long it takes to boot up. It is incredibly fast, as you can tell. And here we are at the desktop. Everything is installed, and now we can do some additional testing. I will say that I think the main bottleneck for this PC is the amount of RAM it has, because 512 megabytes is used for the integrated GPU. Windows 10 will use about 1.5 to 1.8 of that upon boot. So about half of your available RAM is taken up no matter what. So you really don't have a lot to work with, whether you're just trying to browse the web in Chrome or do some other type of productivity application. Browsing the web though is just fine. Uh, I haven't really used too many tabs open at once, but Reddit seems to work just fine. However, if you do open a web page in Chrome, go do something else and then come back, the web page might be white and it might have to reload itself. Just pulling up Fraps so we can do a quick gaming test. Here we're taking a look at Flatout 2. It's a Fairly old game, I think, by today's standards, but it's still pretty good in terms of a good all-around driving game. Settings were pretty much at 1080p, no anti-aliasing, and just a little bit of anisotropic filtering. Uh, the texture quality in the game is set to very high, which is the maximum it can be set at. Now we're going to do a couple of quick runs through the game. You can see that it loads incredibly fast, so the CPU and the SSD are just fine for this particular game. The GPU, however, could use an improvement, as I'm sure is the case across pretty much any game at, rather. Um, even though it says it's getting 80 FPS, frames just aren't as consistent as I would like. Um, again, for a $50 processor, I guess you can't really expect too much. So I think that if you are pretty happy with the general CPU performance. You could drop in maybe an RX 550 or overclock that to get closer to an RX 560 and you have a much better gaming experience than with the Vega 3. Now we're doing some general productivity tests. Here we're taking a look at Microsoft Access. It seems to work just fine using the bare basics. Same for Excel and really the rest of them. So now we're just opening one of the pre-made Excel spreadsheet templates here. 
Taking a look at PowerPoint now, opening one of the pre-made templates in red, because why not? I would imagine if you're dealing with PowerPoint slides with some large images or videos or other add-ins, it could uh, be a little bit sluggish. Taking a look at Publisher now, no problems there. Lastly, Microsoft Word, the classic, as I can I consider it because I used Word more than probably any other Office program. Seems to work just fine as well. Downloading a brochure template, no problems manipulating it. If you are trying to just do full Office productivity, then a sub $200 Windows PC will do you fairly well. Moving on to the Creative Cloud side of things, Acrobat Pro opens quickly and runs just fine. Photoshop, on the other hand, is a bit sluggish. However, once it launches, it is actually pretty usable. Next up is Adobe InDesign. That's kind of the same story. It takes a little bit of time to launch, not quite as long as Photoshop though, but once it opens, it is pretty functional. Now we're getting into Adobe Premiere Pro. This is probably the one that will push this PC the furthest. Just before I opened it, I did copy a small 30 second 4K video clip from my personal computer to this over the network. And you'll see that at 1 8th resolution, it's really sluggish. However, once we go into Adobe Media Encoder and drop in that same file, but use sort of an intermediate codec, such as Avid's DNX HD codec, things are quite a bit better. Again, it took a couple of minutes. We're able to scrub through this clip in pretty much real time. That is pretty good. Adobe Audition launched very quickly. Performance seems to be just fine. If you are dealing with Audition projects that have many effects, that's where things will probably slow down. But for basic use, Audition is totally fine on this computer. Last up is Adobe Lightroom Classic. And doing a couple of basic white balance and cropping, it was able to do those things without any real problems. If you have a lot of different things, so saving files in batches will probably slow things down a bit. And that concludes the Adobe Creative Suite tests. Next up, some more gaming. Here is Overwatch, my favorite first person shooter ever. Everything is low. The display resolution is set to, set to 1600 by 900 with 50% render scale. Going into the practice range, it's it's similar to flat out to where the frame rate that it's telling you is kind of okay. It says it's in the 70s and stuff, but there is, it's just not consistent. It's just sluggish here and there. You can see that there are a fair bit of frame skipping. It's not that great of an experience. So if you do plan on playing Overwatch, even at low settings, I would just recommend not doing so. And the next one we've got going on is Trackmania Nations Forever. It is on the low quality setting, not the absolute minimum setting. That is just, it, everything is just flat. No fidelity to the details. Actually playing Trackmania though, it's like Overwatch and Flat Out 2, despite the frame rate counter being in its favor, it really isn't that smooth of an experience because there are just random frame drops. And especially in a game like this that requires the absolute highest level of precision you can get, um, it's just not going to be that playable, I think. The last game test is Just Cause 2. It's another older game that I personally still like playing from time to time. All three of the game's built-in benchmark modes aren't really that favorable, like everything else we've seen so far. I forgot to mention this during the Overwatch tests, but you may have noticed that the VRAM usage was almost maxing out what we were given. Again, 512 megs of system memory is dedicated towards the integrated GPU, and Overwatch was using, what, 90% of it? So I do think that doubling the RAM from 4 gigs to 8 gigs will not only improve system performance, but also gaming performance, because that the amount of video memory quadruples, and a lot of games will take advantage of that. All that's left is to clear the SSD, which I'm doing here, reinstall Windows so that whoever gets it gets a clean, legitimate copy of it, and that is it. So if you are interested in the raffle, simply head over to gadgetunit.com slash raffle, purchase the number of entries you would like, and on Wednesday, January 22nd, I will be choosing the winner. Basically, each person who gets an entry, I'll simply put their name multiple times, depending on the entries they bought, into a plain text list. I'll randomize it. Whoever comes out first is the winner. Thanks a lot for watching this video. If there are any comments, questions, or suggestions about this or any other video, leave those down below in the comments area. But thanks a lot for watching, and I'll talk to you all in the next video.